Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Uh, today's video I would like to um, to introduce some new nuggets into Beatlemania, into the history of uh, the Fab Four, and I uh, want to remind everyone that um, Invisible Hand is in play uh, with these um, nationally presented, internationally presented social engineering icons. And it doesn't necessarily mean that <clears throat> Paul McCartney didn't come from a working class family and John Lennon came from a, a, broken, a broken family, <clears throat> and, uh, which they did in Liverpool. And, um, but once they uh, were scouted, um, once they were trained, conditioned, suited up, then they became more and more and more surveilled and controlled the remainder of their lives as they became very successful in the music, uh, popular music business and social engineering messaging. So, you know, that, that's not unique to the Beatles, people. That's typical in banking. That's typical in the military. That's typical in any area of the clandestine services operations is that you're going to have infiltration, not invasion. But you're going to be surrounded by um, locusts. And why would that be different for Paul McCartney? It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. And it's not any different for William Egan Colby, who became the director of CIA, and then later married a woman 25 years younger than himself. It's... Uh, that's astounding, but his wife was member of the clandestine services and the State Department and CIA and all the straw companies and embassy status, so she was qualified to uh, keep an eye on the old guy, right? That's how it works. That is how it works. So before the Beatles were known, before they were famous, when they were just teenagers coming out of Liverpool... Uh, John Lennon, at age 19, met Cynthia Powell, who was a year older than himself. Um, he didn't particularly romance her or court her, but he did ask her out a couple times, and then he would ignore her, and then he'd run back and apologize. So they had sort of a make-up, break-up style of relationship. And then when um, John and Paul and George Harrison and Pete Best went over to Hamburg, when they um, were doing concerts in Germany, um, Cynthia Powell rented the, uh, the bedroom of John Lennon in his aunt's house, Mimi, because uh, John was raised by his aunt since his mother was on to a different relationship. John didn't have, uh, John Lennon didn't have a relationship with his own father because he was a seaman. He was gone all the time. And, um, and, uh, there's a lot of stories about whether he was given an ultimatum to be with his mother or his father. But anyway, he ended up with his aunt, which was a more stable situation. And um, when he went away, Cynthia moved into, into John Lennon's bedroom and paid rent to, um, to Mimi, to aunt, John Lennon's aunt. That would be like 1958, 1959, 1960, that that was going on when John Lennon was only... I think they got together when John Lennon was 19 years old and Cynthia was 20 years old. All right, and they met in calligraphy class at college. So um, fast forward a few years and uh, around the time that uh, Brian Epstein entered the picture and had the lads sign a contract back in January 1962, putting Pete Best and Paul McCartney, George Harrison and John Lennon all together in a contract with Brian Epstein. Uh, and we get going uh, and then remember uh, at the recording session for an audition at EMI Records with George Martin, the production manager, it was decided that Pete Best shouldn't play the drums that they'd use a studio drummer and um, they had to figure a way to get Pete Best out of the band 
which was complicated since he'd already signed the contract. So <clears throat> that got worked out uh, in August 1962, and Ringo Starr was uh, added to the band. And then um, we get into 1963, and you should know that uh, the Beatles performed at uh, the Royal Albert Hall Theater. And after their concert, uh, they did an interview with a very young Jane Asher, age 17. Now, Jane Asher was a child actress, um, began featuring in films at age six. So she has sort of a background not dissimilar to Natalie Wood. Remember Nakasha Zakarenko, born in San Francisco, then quickly transferred down to uh, Van Nuys and plugged into the Hollywood film business with Orson Welles in Tomorrow is Forever. She was eight years old when she appeared in that movie. That was her first speaking role. But uh, Jane Asher, who's uh, eight, eight years younger than Natalie Wood, she had a similar trajectory herself with the BBC and the film studios in England, Jane Asher. And Jane Asher was doing this interview with the Beatles, and I guess she was charming or charmed by Paul McCartney, so they end up starting a relationship. Now, Paul McCartney was 21 years old, and Jane Asher is 17 years old. And very quickly, uh, since um, Paul McCartney hadn't made any money yet, uh, he didn't have his own home, and all the action is in London, where Paul McCartney doesn't have a residence. So it was uh, decided that uh, Paul should just move in to Jane Asher's parents' home, which happens to be in the theater district and near Piccadilly Circus in West London, which, of course, as we all know, if you've been watching my videos, that's Spooksville, USA, people. And, you know... I guess the light came on for me back in 1987 uh, when I attended a Bohemian uh, hijinks cocktail party evening. And um, I met Secretary of State George Schultz and Department of Defense Secretary Casper Weinberger. And in the room was Phil Harris, who I also met. met. Phil Harris was an orchestra conductor, band leader, actor, radio star partner with Jack Benny, Jack Benny, uh, RKO Radio, and did work with um, RCA Victory, or I uh, forget what that was called. Anyway, he was RCA, CBS Radio, um, celebrity status person, and he's in the room, and I just was scratching my head trying to figure out why would Phil Harris, who's just an inter entertainer, be in the same room as the top CIA guy who's former president of Bechtel Construction Company and the executive vice president, legal counsel, who was Casper Weinberger, Harvard, and George Schultz, Princeton alumni. Why would they ever be in the same room together, you know, drinking wine? And uh, then I find out that uh, the Tonight Show, NBC professional script writers are also at the party and they had prepared the script for George Schultz to read in the dungeon in the basement later that evening when they when they put on a, a, a show scored with music with an orchestra in an orchestra pit in the basement uh, which had they have a theater it's a theater um, cavern I guess you could call it there's no windows but they have a stage they have an orchestra pit they have um reclining seats, uh, theater seats, and uh, George Schultz was the master of ceremony of that evening. It was a spectacularly professionally prepared show. Meanwhile, I'm just uh, having fun and drinking uh, scotch whiskey and uh, taking it all in. And then later, I, I realized that it all makes sense. You see, in the spy business, in the spooks business, in the social engineering business, you know, actors are really important, and scripts are important, and adaptations from novels. So writers, um, authors, screen adaptations, uh, lighting, wardrobe. It's essential to presenting imagery, imagery, 
And when you realize that magic is at the core of all this, which is the art of deception, the art of, of capturing your imagination and capturing you, the person, through your mind, then you realize that Spooksville is really the connection of banking, money laundering, through acting and scenarios into managing society at all levels. There's really three levels of society. I mean, there's more than three, but I'm going to simplify it. Nobility class at the top, which is the people that own everything. They own all the real estate. They own all the buildings. They own all the businesses at the corporate level. You know, the, the big, bigs, the bigs, the big corporations. Nobility class controls. And, of course, they control all the education system. Of course, they control Harvard University, Stanford University, Princeton, Yale, MIT, the University of California systems. It makes no difference. They control all education, even down to the public school system. Is You can't get a book approved and get in there without their approval. So there's nobility class. There's vassal class, who's the management that's employed by the nobility class to do the actual work so they don't get their fingernails dirty. And then there's the the serfs or the the workers, the worker bees at the bottom. That's the lowest class, the working class. That's where Paul McCartney and John Lennon and myself would f figure into that class. So Jane Ash, Asher came from vassal class. She Her parents were professionals and they had, um, you know, well-educated positions in society and that's how she was plugged into acting at, at age six and so it's befitting that she would have access to the Beatles after they'd signed their contract with Brian Epstein and were approved were approved to do a record deal with EMI which is owned by RCA and CBS if you go up the food chain you'll see that all roads lead to RCA and CBS and the comedy of course is that the Rolling Stones had a deal later in the next year with Decca Records that had rejected the Beatles and then accepted the Rolling Stones after they saw that the Beatles were successful. But it's just a joke because Decca Records that was the was the recording studio for the Rolling Stones, led by Lewis Paul Jones, not not Mick Jagger, not Keith uh, Richards. Paul Jones was the leader. And you'll notice he got murdered. So <laughs> but he was the leader of the Rolling Stones. And the leader of the Beatles was Brian Epstein. And he got murdered too, right? Do you see a little trend here? That the Rolling Stones leader was murdered and that the Beatles leader was murdered once they became successful. In other words, they weren't murdered at the beginning. They were murdered once they were established. The leader was taken out. The one that the boys all trusted. That's a command and control decision right anyway trying to stay on track with uh john lennon and paul mccartney but uh it's so tempting to uh you have to understand who uh is watching them and who gets introduced to them because the boys literally have thousands of young ladies that would like to go on dates with them and perhaps have their babies right and get married because uh, once you make it you have a lot of uh, female fan love but that's not really who got access to Paul McCartney and John Lennon so because John has been dating Cynthia and um, Cynthia gets pregnant that's what happens because they've been dating for four years four years in between John you know going on long trips and tours right because Cynthia's not going with him she's trying to uh, go to college in Liverpool so uh, she gets pregnant and then they do an impromptu wedding not too different than Ronald Reagan and Nancy Davis did and um, but the wedding is sort of a comedy because they go to the registry office and uh, there's some construction project going on simultaneously and then Brian Epstein doesn't want the public to know that John Lennon is getting married just like they didn't want Elvis Presley to get married because that could damage the popularity with the ladies 
you want to sell the idea that a record buyer might uh, fall in love with uh, John Lennon and then want to marry him and have his baby. So they want to keep that um, belief system alive. Meanwhile, John Lennon is marrying Cynthia Powell. And there's no flowers and there's no music. And then there's this uh, pneumatic uh, hammer, Jack. Jackhammer making noise while they're reciting their vows. And Brian Epstein is right there controlling everything and reminding John that he has to perform that night. So there'll be no honeymoon. It's not going to be a honeymoon. So Cynthia Powell did not get a honeymoon on her wedding date, which if you want to be specific, I'm talking about August 23rd, 1962. Julian Lennon is born um, June, He's born in April 1963. Uh, on um, April 8th, 1963, Julian Lennon is born. And uh, his mother had married uh, John... Lennon on August 23rd, 1962. But what I'm telling you is that uh, in, in 1963, at the Royal Albert Hall, on April 18th, 1963, okay, which is, uh, which is 10 days after Julian Lennon is born, 10 days after Julian Lennon is born, John Lennon and Paul McCartney are performing at the uh, the Royal Albert Hall, and Jane Asher is interviewing them. You should also know that uh, John Lennon was not present for Julian's birth because he was touring with the Beatles. He came and uh, saw his newborn son four days after his birth and then announced, I have to go to Barcelona, Spain with Brian Epstein for a holiday, which I think is really inappropriate. It wasn't a tour. It wasn't It wasn't a Beatles concert. It was just John and Brian Epstein together going on a vacation to Barcelona, Spain, when John just had his baby son. So I'm just, I'm not, that's not a flattering picture that I'm painting here for John Lennon, but it is what it is. In other words, he had a rotten childhood. John Lennon's father was never around. And guess what? John Lennon is also not around for Julian. Deliberately on purpose not around. Because he certainly could have just stayed with his wife, Cynthia, and her newborn, Julian. But he instead goes off with a homosexual man, Brian Epstein, to Barcelona, uh, Spain for four days. Then he comes back, and then instead of spending time with Cynthia, he's having an interview done with Jane Asher in London, in the theater district. And Jane Asher, just so you know, her parents live, you know, walking distance from the the um, Royal Albert Hall. It's very close proximity. It's the Savile District, Savile Way. Um, again, close proximity to uh, Green Park. Close proximity to Piccadilly Circus is uh, walking distance. It's right there. It's the theater district. It's not that far away from um, where Cass Elliott was done away with and where Keith Moon later was done away with. It's the same neighborhood. Anyway, what I'm saying is that there goes Paul McCartney moving into Jane Asher's parents' home in close proximity where this interview is happening at the Royal Albert Hall. Okay, so very well. Then we move forward and... What happens next? Well, I'll tell you what's happening next is that uh, in the background, we have all these Jewish people that are uh, ready to come on board as the revenues pick up. The original contract uh, with um, EMI that Brian Epstein negotiated for the Beatles paid one penny per album, and an album had six songs, three on each side. Yeah, that was if the sale was recorded in the United Kingdom. However, if the sale occurred in Europe, in continental Europe, or in the United States, it was uh, reduced by 50% to half a penny. It was half a penny per record. So you need to sell a lot of uh, albums. Because this is, again, 1963. It's before John Kennedy has been assassinated. It's uh, before the Ed Sullivan show occurs, which is in February 1964, you know, shortly after the John Kennedy assassination. 
is when the Beatles hit big, big time in the United States. But uh, what I'm saying is that uh, this is 1963, and Ringo Starr is now in the band, but they're they're well known, and they've sold a million records in continental Europe. But let me tell you, uh, I don't have the breakdown between how many of the records were in England versus uh, France or Germany, but uh, let's assume that they got paid a penny on a million. So what does that work out to? Well, you'll be disappointed to know it's $10,000. <laughs> or let's say 10,000 pounds, which maybe that's $15,000 in 1963. This is before Ed Sullivan. Before Ed Sullivan, the Beatles had sold a million records and made a grand total of 15,000, of which they've got to pay Brian Epstein. His the, They redid the contract after Pete Best left, so now Brian Epstein gets 15 to 25% per record. So... Let's say it gets 20%. So there's only eight tenths of a penny left times a million. So it's $10,000 split four ways. It's not quite split equally because, you know, it depends who got the publishing rights. There's performing on the album, singing or playing your instruments. All right. Then there's a, who wrote the song, who crafted the melody. Those, those two actually go under publishing. Um, and if you have the status of writing the lyrics and the status of arranging the melodies, then you get a special bonus split for that. And John Lennon and Paul McCartney were dominating that category. Now, some of the songs on their albums, of course, were other people's songs like Chuck Berry, etc., and they would cover other people's songs. So there they actually have to subtract and pay the other artists publishing company because the other artist probably doesn't own their own music see anyway so this is an accounting problem people you see this with television and film where the artist has no chance of understanding how they get paid in other words it's real easy to bamboozle people and you know paul mccartney is 21 years old john lennon is 23 years old cynthia his wife is 24 years old brian epstein is 29 years old and it's 1963, and I'm here to tell you, even Brian Epstein doesn't probably understand the math on those contracts. And so, uh, and he's the manager. He's the manager, and I'm willing to bet you at age 29 that he doesn't completely understand. He wasn't that good of a student, all right, in school, and he was a complete dropout in school. He burnt, he got expelled from three boarding schools, and he got thrown out of the Royal Army, okay, under a medical leave because he was a homosexual. So the thing is that Brian Epstein's not the sharpest pencil. And that's who's managing the Beatles. And what I'm telling you is he's not managing the Beatles. He's the fake manager of the Beatles. He makes sure the guys show up, you know, dressed, ready to play, on time. That's, that's what Brian Epstein is. And he's got this Peter Brown guy in the background, along with there's other assistants that we don't know the names of or we don't know their full names. So there's a whole team of people that are organizing the travel plans for the Beatles. And I'm here to tell you that's going to be the invisible hand that works for the EMI, CBS, RCA. That's who's managing the Beatles, not Brian Epstein. He's a diversion. He's a distraction. Now, he's the front person who the boys go to with problems, okay? But he's buffered because there's people behind the scenes that decide the wardrobe, what hotels they stay at, what airlines to fly on, and uh, the itinerary is decided by someone else, which would be the people that control the radio frequencies and control the theaters, which is the big corporations that are social engineering controlled and have themes from the Tavistock Institute or some psychological, social engineering, anthropology policy, which is where those songs are coming from, people. Those Beatles songs are not just conjured up in the, you know, in the bathroom, you know, in between showering and brushing your teeth. Um, I believe adult supervision is involved with choosing the lyrics and melodies to assist in fast-tracking these groups' popularity. I'm sure there's people that won't believe me. But hey, that's that's consistent with everything I cover. 
Of course, you don't want to look under the rock. You want it to be the way it's been portrayed to you. So what I'm saying is Gene Asher is just not any, you know, what do you call it? Uh, bimbo, um, wannabe, groupie. No way. She's a classy lady and she's very young. She's a very young, classy young woman. But uh, now Paul McCartney is sleeping in her bedroom. You know, this again is similar to Natalie Wood because she has Robert Wagner sleeping in her bedroom at 7708 Woodrow Wilson Drive in her gated compound uh, when she's age 18 years old. Natalie Wood has have a man nine years older than her, age 27. Robert Wagner, age 27, is sleeping in Natalie Wood's bed in Laurel Canyon, atop Laurel Canyon, on Woodrow Wilson Drive. And they have the same situation with Jane Asher and uh, Paul McCartney, although, you know, it's age 17 and 21. It's not as dramatic an age difference as Robert Wagner and Natalie Wood. Not her real name, right? Everybody on cue. Natasha Zakarenko. All right, so... The Jane Ash and Asher situation continues on for five years, and we get out to when we have the Summer of Love in San Francisco with uh, Timothy Leary comes to town, and Jimmy Jones comes to town, and Hunter S. Thompson comes to town to San Francisco, and Bill Graham is in town promoting free, I said free concerts, and he's getting paid somehow. Fillmore West, there was Fillmore East in New York, and there's Fillmore West in San Francisco. And Bill Graham is running the show. Even though he doesn't own the building, George Sullivan owns that building. But guess what? In the Summer of Love, 1967, George Sullivan gets shot in the head on August 2nd, 1967, the Summer of Love. And he goes bye-bye in San Francisco, freeing up Fillmore West on the corner of Fillmore and Geary Boulevard, San Francisco. And Bill Graham takes over Fillmore West to host all of his Columbia Records and Warner Brothers uh, recording stars like Janis Joplin, like Grace Slick, you know, formerly of the Great Society and now of the Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead and Carlos Santana. And even George Harrison comes to visit. George Harrison. And later, John Lennon and Yoko Ono and Frank Zappa come and perform at Fillmore West. Yes, they do. And don't forget, when Yoko Ono and uh, John Lennon get married, who attends their honeymoon celebration, which they celebrate, you know, the peace movement? Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary visits John Lennon and Yoko Ono in Montreal, Canada. Yes, he does. And he's working in San Francisco with Abigail Folger's mother. Anyway, what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, Jane Asher, I think, was the first attempt at surveilling um, Paul McCartney. And um, in, the, in the ensuing years, I think she would have been fine. She was sent off with Paul to go to see the Maharishi in India. Jane Asher attended that trip. Cynthia Powell, uh, Lennon did not. She remained home with Julian, and John Lennon went solo. And Mike Love of the Beach Boys went, and Mia Farrow went. That was February. It was supposed to be 90 days. February, March, and April 1968 was this uh, transcendental meditation trip, 12-hour plane flight from London to um, India, to a basically a, uh, you know, a mind control facility in a remote area. And um, what I'm telling you is that Jane Asher went on that trip, so she had to have been approved. Mia Farrow was there. She had finished her filming of Rosemary's Baby at the Dakota, and that's very important for you to know. All these things are being done simultaneously. Rosemary's Baby was filmed at the uh, Dakota, where John Lennon was later murdered. August 21st, 1967 to December 20th, 1967, Mia Farrow played a 21-year-old woman impregnated by Satan, by the devil, while her cuckold uh, husband 
played by Paul uh, John Cassavetes, made a deal to become famous in the entertainment industry in exchange for allowing the devil to impregnate his wife. That was the theme of Rosemary's Baby. Rosemary's Baby's father is Satan. It's the devil. Meanwhile, they got Sharon Tate doing The Eye of the Devil with David Niven and Donald Plants filmed in England. Sharon Tate is doing her devil movie. Not with Roman Polanski. Roman Polanski's not involved with The Eye of the Devil. Roman Polanski is really not in the Sharon Tate orbit, yet he, he becomes in the orbit in 1967, which is when, you know, Jane Asher is all over Paul McCartney and John Lennon is sort of bouncing around from groupies to his wife, Cynthia Powell. So after this, uh, what you should know is that just before they head off to India, Brian Epstein gets murdered, I believe murdered in his Sussex home, which is about 60 miles south of London um, in Sussex. And this throws a spanner wrench into things because, uh, because the Beatles don't have a manager. So that throws the lawyers into the mix and the lawyers hire consultants and they start you know, figuring out what to do. And you see the Beatles are not really being managed by anybody that they trust. They've lost total control once Brian Epstein dies. And I don't think Brian Epstein was in control, but the Beatles perhaps thought he was in control. And he died on um, August 27th, 1967. Brian Samuel Epstein is murdered. I believe murdered. And I believe that John Lennon believed he was murdered. And now the Beatles don't have anyone who handles their finances that they trust. Uh, so they're in a pickle. And I'm sure that they didn't choose to go off to India to see the Maharishi. I think that they were told to do that. So they do it. And that's a controlled situation. It's cut short. They don't do 90 days. I think they do, you know, like 30 days. Then later it's said that they... Uh, produce 48 songs for the White Album. Poppycock on that. I don't believe they could produce really any songs in that kind of an environment when your manager had just been murdered. I don't think they produced any songs. I sincerely doubt that. I think they were depressed and confused and bewildered. But the show must go on, right? But it probably goes on with script writers and songwriters off camera. All right, so you should know that where Jane Ash, Asher's uh, parents live is uh, right near, you know, the Piccadilly Circus. But anyway, once the money starts coming in a little bit, uh, you know, after the Ed Sullivan show in 1964, then Paul McCartney gets his own home in London. And that address of the home is 7 Cavendish Avenue, St. John's Wood. It's in walking distance to the Regent's Park, which is where, which is where um, Brian Epstein was originally stationed when he was conscripted into the army. He was stationed at Regent's Park, London, which is uh, really close to where Paul McCartney gets his home at uh, 7 Cavendish Avenue. And that's about a mile and a half away from Jane Ash, Asher's parents. And Gene Asher moves in to Paul McCartney's house at 7 Cavendish Avenue. But she's a model and she's an actress. And so she is, you know, has her own profession that she goes on trips. And while she's away on a trip, a Jewish woman, I mean, I didn't see this coming, Francie Swartz arrives spontaneously in London. I guarantee you, you know, she was sent on a mission. So she arrives in London on April 3rd, 1968. This is when, you know, Jane Asher and Paul McCartney have returned from seeing the Maharishi. And, and then Jane goes off on a work assignment. And then this uh, Jewish gal, Francie Swartz, rolls into town. And she's approximately the same age as Jane Asher. She's a year older, actually. So uh, at this point in 1968... Uh, Jane Asher is now, um, she's 22 years old, and Francie 
Swartz is 23 years old. Anyway, to make a long story boring, Francie approaches uh, Paul McCartney allegedly because she wants to have him read a script that she's written regarding the Carnegie Hall in New York and a violinist. And Anyway, she ends up in bed with Paul McCartney at his 7 Cavendish Avenue. Jane Ash Asher returns from her business trip a few days early and discovers Francie Swartz in Paul McCartney's, in her bed. And this is a problem. So then she storms out and then goes to her parents' home over by Piccadilly Circus. Then Jane Asher's mother immediately goes over to Paul McCartney's home to get all of her daughter's clothes and belongings and kitchenware. And because that relationship is now over. <laughs> That's how the Jane Asher story it wasn't officially over, but as far as uh, dating, I think that it all came to a screeching halt. They've been seeing each other for five years. Uh, they were engaged to be married, but hadn't been married yet, but they were engaged. And then Jane Asher, shortly after this incident, and when I say shortly, I mean within, within three months, uh, she announces that the engagement is over, uh, you know, through the media. So it's uh, so long to Jane Asher. Now, that doesn't mean that Francie Swartz is moving in. Oh, no. No, because we have another Jewish girl involved. Her name is Linda Eastman. You may have heard of her before. Linda Eastman, who that's not her real name. No, her name is Epstein. It's Linda Epstein. You know why we say that? I mean, yes, Linda Eastman's Jewish father, who's an entertainment lawyer in New York, his name is Lee Eastman, but that's not his real name. No, 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 it's not. So what is his real name? I'm just curious what Linda Eastman's real father's name is. So I'll tell you, his, her real name is Leopold Vale Epstein. Ep Epstein. So in other words, uh, as soon as Francie Swartz uh, does her thing about torpedoing the... Um, Jane Asher situation, Linda Eastman comes in. Now, she's fresh off a divorce to her scion husband who is from Illuminati status. Joseph Melville C. was the husband of Linda Eastman. And Linda Eastman's uh, father, Lee, and Linda Eastman's older brother, who's also an entertainment lawyer, like his dad, um, they're, they're vassal class. They're, they're doing well. They're living in a nice part of New York State, uh, Scarsdale, I believe, and they, they live in pretty pretty well, but they're not nobility class. They're working class, up, upscale, vassal class. But this uh, Joseph Melville C., he's tip of the top, and it's all very secretive. You can't find out who Joseph Melville C.'s parents are and what they did for a living, but he went to Princeton, and after Princeton, he went off to University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona, and that is where he met Linda, Linda Eastman, if you want to call her that, Linda Epstein. And they met and quickly fell into a romance and uh, got married. And she got pregnant and they had Heather. They had a daughter, Heather. But see, Joseph uh, Melville C., he's loaded. He's hundreds of millions of dollars. So he likes to go off to Peru or Africa for long periods. He's not really marriage material. He's just a wealthy trust fund brat. So while he's on one of his trips, not checking in, Linda Eastman decides she's had enough. She goes back to New York to her parents. And then she meets, I believe, Paul McCartney in New York City. So uh, they become acquainted. acquainted. You should know that uh, Linda Eastman's father also had managed uh, Jim, Jim, Jimmy Dorsey, amongst many other celebrities in the New York, New Jersey area. Anyway, so uh, not really sure where to go next, but my point is that every place that the Beatles are in London is British intelligence, CIA controlled. The women that are coming into the picture, Yoko Ono inserts herself in London. She draw, she flies magically to London to see Paul McCartney to um, to ask for songs that were written between 
Paul and John. Uh, she wants to do a, a book of songs for Lennon McCartney. And he and Paul McCartney doesn't give her any songs. He says, you should check with John. Maybe he'll help you. So then she gloms on to John and they go to a art gallery and spend time together. Yoko Ono comes from nobility class, the highest class there is. She, her father is a banker. And um, I mean, you won't believe the category that Yoko Ono comes from. I mean, it's really well disguised, but Yoko Ono's father was a banker, okay? And he was an executive uh, banker and his adopted mother comes from Scion category in Tokyo, Japan from a long line of samurai uh, no, nobility people. And um, she, uh, Yoko Ono's father, <sighs> Yoko Ono was born in 1933, whereas John Lennon was born in um, 1940. So Yoko Ono is uh, essentially seven years older than John Lennon. Cynthia Powell is one year older than John Lennon. Linda Eastman is one year older than Paul McCartney. So now the boys are with older women. Slightly older women. But in the case of Yoko Ono, she's seven years older than John. And she's running the show. And there's no doubt about it. Her father um, was an executive with uh, Yokohama Specie Bank. And he was transferred to San Francisco office when two weeks before Yoko Ono was born in Tokyo, Japan. And so um, Yoko didn't meet her father until she was age two when her family tra traveled to San Francisco. Then the family was transferred back to Tokyo and Yoko Ono was enrolled in the most prestigious boarding schools of, that are near the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. And she graduated high school from the uh, very prestigious, very difficult to get into, very limited enrollment of what's called the... Uh, Gokshushin, and she graduated high school in 1951. She was immediately accepted into the philosophy program at the Gashu, Gaushima University as the first female to ever enter the philosophy department. And she did, but she only did two semesters. She quit and then decided to, her family had gone ahead to New York City in 1952. So Yoko Ono then moved to New York City from Tokyo, Japan. And she enrolled in Yonkers at the Sarah Lawrence College. And she immediately met another um, elite conductor, orchestra conductor, and she married him. And, uh, and then she formed, they, they wouldn't get along. And uh, she got depressed, was put into a insane asylum in New York uh, for Japanese people and then she had a jazz musician who helped um, liberate her she marries him they have a short three-year marriage and then then after that she sent to London to zero in on on John Lennon and uh, so I'm saying that that's an assignment that that when Yoko Ono got out of the mental institution and had a very brief relationship with a jazz musician in New York then takes off to go to London, not on her own. I think she was sent there specifically to um, to surveil John Lennon, which she never left his sight, you know, um, after 1968, you know, which is even before the divorce to um, Cynthia happened. But I believe the divorce to uh, Cynthia Powell occurred in 1968. John Lennon immediately married Yoko Ono, that might be 1967. They do the, uh, the the bed in. Timothy Leary appears. Timothy Leary is CIA. I'm saying that Yoko Ono is CIA. I'm saying that uh, the Summer of Love is CIA. I'm saying that the Maharishi is CIA. I'm saying that uh, that now Paul McCartney is enveloped with Linda Eastman and her older brother John and her father Lee who's 30 years older than Paul McCartney, 
is the um, the senior lawyer of Paul McCartney because all of Paul McCartney's um, life is now handled by the Eastman family. Lee and John Eastman become Paul McCartney's lawyer, and that is uh, not manager, but manage all Paul McCartney. Now, I'm just telling you from my experience as a CPA, it is not appropriate that you have your girlfriend, your girlfriend's older brother be your lawyer, and your girlfriend's father be your lawyer. That's, you're, you're suffocated. In other words, every aspect of Paul McCartney's life from 1968 on is completely controlled by this Jewish family called the Epstein family, but they go by Eastman. And hey, it's the Beatles. It's the number one social engineering pop music group in the world in 1968 is the Beatles. And they're completely and utterly controlled. We got Yoko Ono, we got uh, Linda Eastman, more importantly, at Linda Eastman's father and brother. They're the ones that are doing the money business. And I don't think Yoko Ono is handling the money, but she's handling John in the way that Brian Epstein handled all the boys. And you see you got George Harrison off with Patty Boyd, but uh, you know he's bouncing around under surveillance at all times with Eric Clapton. It's like all these people are under surveillance, just like Laurel Canyon in Hollywood. All the musical artists are under surveillance there. And all the Hollywood stars are under surveillance in Benedict Canyon and the Malibu Colony and Calabasas, Hidden Hills, West Hills, Encino, all the enclaves, all the Holmby Hills, all the executives, all the studio managers are all surveilled. It's not just Sharon Tate. It's not just Abigail Folger. It's Yoko Ono. It's John Lennon. It's Neil Young. It's uh, Stephen Stills. It's Jim Morrison. There are no exceptions. And old Frank Zappa comes and goes in this story. All right. Well, anyway, I just wanted to tell you that, that uh, everybody's controlled. Every single person in this story is controlled. And, okay, so... Linda Eastman ends up dying of breast cancer, which metastasizes in her pancreas or liver, and she dies in 1998. And about 18 months later, her former husband, Joseph, who's the Joseph Melville C., he has his head shot with a pistol in Tucson, Arizona. He's the father of Heather, who's been now legally adopted by Paul McCartney because Joseph is an absentee father. But he does see Heather and tries to make amends with her, despite the fact that Paul, Paul McCartney's the legal father of Heather. But anyway, he has his brains, brains blown off just a mile away from where Linda, Linda Eastman dies of her cancer because the Paul McCartney and Linda bought a 150-acre ranch about a mile away from Joseph Melville's property in Tucson, Arizona. So they're neighbors and they're friendly and they're getting along. And, um, but I'm telling you, so, uh, Linda, Linda McCartney dies and about 18 months later, Joseph Melville C gets shot in the back of the head, not too differently than Art Linklater's son, um, John Zwire did. So I'm not going to get into the motivations there. I mean, the guy was rich. So, it, you know, I've seen discussions that he's jealous that Linda didn't leave him any of her $200 million estate. He doesn't need the money. He's probably got $800 million of his own. It's definitely not a money motive problem. Um, but it's possible he might have been murdered. I just want you to know that uh, where Rosemary's Baby was filmed, this ends up to be where John Lennon is murdered on uh, December. Um, you know, they wrapped up filming a Rosemary's Baby on December 20th, 1967. And then it is on... Um, You know, John Lennon is done away with, I believe, on December 8, 1980. And um, he is murdered by the CIA. Okay? He's not murdered by Mark Chapman. I'm calling poppycock on the Mark Chapman situation. Um, Jose Perdomo 
was the doorman at the Dakota where they filmed Rosemary's Baby. Now, I don't know how long he'd been a doorman there. I, I would think it would be sort of like a Lee Harvey Oswald situation where they just plugged him in there about four to five weeks before John Lennon's murder. Um, but Jose Perdomo has a 30-year career with the CIA. It all began in Cuba, in Havana. Jose was a policeman uh, under the Batista regime. And when the Batista regime was switched out for the Fidel Castro situation, Frank Sturgis was working closely with, um, with Fidel Castro. And, um, and Jose Menendez was there. Remember Jose, Jose Menendez? He's involved in this story also. So in 1959, both Jose Menendez leaves Havana during the Fidel Castro rule, which he's another CIA operative. There was no revolution. That was a fake revolution. They just switched out Batista for, for Fidel Castro, who never was murdered, never was assassinated. That's kind of a tell right there, right? They have no problem murdering John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy or Patrice Lumumba, and, but they have some kind of a problem killing Fidel Castro. No, they didn't want to kill him. Anyway, Jose Menendez is spirited out of there, probably by the United States Navy in 1959. And that's when Jose Perdomo leaves, and that's when Frank Sturgis leaves. And they both go to Miami, Florida, which I'm sure that Jose Menendez went to Miami, Florida, too. So they go to Miami initially. And, um, you know, Jose Menendez is only 16 years old. Jose Perdomo is 24 years old. And Frank Sturgis, who's an Italian from Philadelphia, he's 34 years old. And he's the control uh, agent for Jose Perdomo. And he becomes involved with the um, you know Miami Lakes, Bay of Pigs invasion force, strike force, debacle, which was a psychops, wasn't a serious invasion. And he's also involved with Frank Sturgis in the Bay of Pigs. And then he's also involved with Frank Sturgis in Watergate, which had nothing to do with Richard Nixon. And um, it was a minimum of three burglaries. We only talk about one. Uh, there's probably many burglaries. When I say burglaries, I mean the installation of listening devices. They're not stealing anything. They're installing things. And then Jose Perdomo ends up, uh, Frank Sturgis goes on to be involved with the Jack Kennedy assassination in Dallas, Texas. I don't know if Jose Perdomo was involved with the John Kennedy assassination. He might have been. But Frank Sturgis sure as heck was. And by the way, that's not Frank Sturgis' real name. I think it's Fiorino, Fiorini. Anyway, um, everybody's got a different name. But I can tell you that Jose Perdomo becomes the doorman at the Dakota. And he's quoted as saying to Mark Chapman when Mark Chapman ran into the lobby to look at the bleeding out John Lennon. Jose Perdomo said, get out of here. Go away. Go away. And... Um, because I guess John Lennon wasn't dead yet. <laughs> so I think Jose Perdomo made sure that John Lennon was given a fatal wound. And that I believe that the Mark Chapman character is like the Saran Saran guy who fires a gun, but doesn't hit the target. And then Jose Perdomo, who's a professional guerrilla trained murderer, just like Frank Sturgis is, guerrilla trained CIA from the United States Marines, okay, they know how to put someone down. And Jose Perdomo is a professionally trained assassin. And he makes sure that Paul, that uh, John Lennon is done away with. John Lennon didn't go to the hospital in an ambulance. He went in a New York City police car. So just letting you know, they didn't wait around for the ambulance. And um, that's the end of John Lennon. And guess what? What? You know, Yoko Ono still lives in the Dakota. Wouldn't you move out? If, you're, um, if your husband was slaughtered in the lobby, do you think that you perhaps might uh, want to move out of that business? I mean, I wouldn't want to live in a building where my wife was murdered. That's creepy. But anyway, Yoko Ono's stayed there. That's where Rosemary's baby was. She was impregnated by Satan there. John Lennon was murdered there. And Yoko Ono, Yoko ono who's 89 years old, she's going to be 90 this February in 2023, Yoko Ono remains there. So I'm saying that's a CIA building and Yoko Ono is a CIA operative and that they do CIA films there and like Rosemary's Baby. 
And uh, that all makes sense. It all makes sense. Anyway, hit the like and subscribe. We'll talk soon. Have a great day.